Brothers, sisters, let us gladly give to God our all our best. Service hearty, thorough, honest, with a living love impressed. All our duty, all our striving, all our time to Him belong. Praise Him then with true devotion. Come before Him with a song. By His mercy, by His bounty, by the gift of Christ His Son. What great good. service for the sake of Christ your Son. Though our hope abides now only in the righteousness He won. Bless and save us, help and guide us, watch to comfort and restore. Till in heaven we rest rejoicing, praising you Good morning to each of you. Wherever you might be joining us for our virtual service, we are happy to have you be a part of this worship to give all glory and honor to our gracious Savior. And above all, we remember on this fifth Sunday of Easter that he is our risen Savior. And because he is risen from the dead, we have the promise that we too shall rise and that all of our life has value and meaning because of what he has done for us. We ask God to be with us in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Jesus is the cornerstone upon which the church is built. What do we believe concerning him? We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. Amen. Luther writes in his large catechism, Christ himself has entrusted absolution to his Christian church and commanded us to absolve one another from sins. So if there is a heart that feels its sin and desires consolation, 
It has here a sure refuge when it hears in God's word that through a fellow human being, God absolves a person from sin. We confess, Sovereign Lord, forgive my open sins and my secret sins. Forgive the sins I know and the sins I do not know. Forgive the sins I did to please myself and the sins I did to please others. Forgive them all, gracious Lord, for Jesus' sake. We pause for a moment of silent introspection. Be assured then, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in our sins. Hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We join our hearts in the prayer of the day. Lord God, you form the minds of your faithful people into a single will. By your grace, enable us to love what you command and desire what you promise, so that our lives ever follow you and our hearts stay focused on the lasting joys of heaven with you. Hear us as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We join now in singing the first two stanzas of Jesus, Lead Us On. This time we invite all the, the kids to kind of come forward or lean into the, to the TV or computer screen, pay, pay real close attention for our, our children's devotion. And I hope you are all having a, a two thumbs up kind of day where, wherever, wherever you are. Thanks for, for joining with us today too. Um, we live in an amazing place. And it's that time of year where, where we start to, to spend a little bit more time outside. And with the mountains nearby here in Colorado, well, I think most of the kids that I know that are listening to this are gonna, gonna spend a little bit of time walking in those mountains too. And on the trails that we walk, there's a very important person that we come upon sometimes. I usually, not always, but usually they're, they're dressed in kind of a shade of green and tan, and they have a really neat hat on. Um, and maybe they have a badge and, and, and some other things, usually a backpack with a, with a first aid kit. And if we come across those persons, they're called rangers, we know that they are there always for our help. But in a really interesting way, when, when we're lost and we come upon one of those rangers, we know that those people know the way. And sometimes they say, just, just follow me and I'll get you right back to where we need to go. Jesus is like that too. In, in, our, in our world, we, we live in such a strange time. Sometimes we get very lost, whether we're, we're, we're young and little or, or whether we're young at heart and bigger. Um, but, but, but Jesus is, is 
loving enough to remind us of who he is, to bring us to himself and, and, and to smile to each of us and say, I don't just know the way, I am the way. And I don't just know the way to your physical home, I know and I am the way to your heavenly home. Follow me to heaven, because I am the only way. That's what our Jesus says. Let's, let's smile and, and say a prayer of thanksgiving for that, shall we? Let's fold our hands in our hearts. Dear Jesus, dear Jesus, thank you for knowing the way. Thank you for knowing the way. Thank you for being the way. Thank you for being the way. Comfort me when I feel lost. Comfort me when I feel lost. And lead me home to heaven. And lead me home to heaven. In your name I pray. Amen. Okay, thanks. Go back, uh, lean back into the couch, I guess, and uh, listen real, real hard uh, with mom, with dad, and uh, God bless the rest of your day. Christ is risen. He is, he is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Hallelujah. The Gospel according to John, chapter 14. We read the first verses, some of the powerful, magnificent, loving verses of our Savior to his disciples that night in the upper room, the night before he died. Our Savior comforts, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If that were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do not know, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. Christ is risen. He is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Alleluia. We now sing the third and fourth stanza of Jesus, Lead Us On.
To those who were living at a time that was less than luxurious, um, Peter is bold to assure and to declare grace and peace be yours in abundance. And my friends, they are. They are to you. They are for you. They are even at these times because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia and amen. It's kind of a strange phenomenon when a global pandemic and then the calendar date collide to give us a special insight. And I know that maybe sounds a little bit silly, and I'm not in any way saying that God moved heaven and earth so that I would have an easy sermon illustration and introduction on a day like today. But if he did, I'll, I'll breathe a prayer of thanksgiving. Because here's what we get to ponder when we compare coronavirus to Mother's Day. They both illustrate a phenomenal point. So step back and, and, and look at the, the global pandemic, and, and suddenly, very much in the conversation is the concept of essential, right? As we reevaluate and revamp our days and our routines, our errands and our opportunities, as we stay safer at home or safe at home or wherever we are, we, we understand what tasks are essential. And we've been told and informed and kind of warned Pay attention to what is most critical, and then only go out for that which is most critical. Because they esteem the essential and focus on it. So says the global pandemic of coronavirus, COVID-19. And Mother's Day is the exact same thing. Not necessarily in, in those regards, I know it's a little bit differently, but, but it puts the essential nature of something into the familial category. So the, the, the reason that we scour for Mother's Day cards and that we reserve our Zoom family meeting invites and, and things like that, the, way, the reason we, we send flowers is because we want to express to our moms what a blessing, what a, our mom, what a, what a blessing she is. And we want her to know that, that we consider her an essential part of the family in which God has placed us and we appreciate her, we love and respect her, adore her. And so moms are esteemed essential. Okay, maybe, maybe it's a little bit of a stretch to connect COVID-19 and Mother's Day in those regards, but, but with the, the concept of essentiality before us and things that are esteemed essential, <clears throat> maybe our hearts are, are prone now just, just a little bit to, to look into the Spirit inspired and see how God talks about things that are essential. In a marvelous way, as we turn that gem of God's Word the, this morning that's exactly what we get to, we get to see. As, as the Spirit of Grace teaches us through, through 2 Peter chapter, chapter 2, uh, he, he reminds us, informs us, both of who and of whom and for what is esteemed essential. And my friends, that's marvelous. So here we go. You, you have that, that lesson before you. It is printed on pages 8 and 9 in, in your service booklet. I'm going to read just the, just the first five, five verses of, of this section. And again, pay attention to, to where the focus falls. The who esteems essential. So, so who, has, who has drawn the focus somewhere? The who is essential, the, the where the focus is drawn. And then also, we want to make sure we're, we're understanding the why is this essential. Here's what Peter writes to, to Christians. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now, to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone and a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. It's a wonderfully complex um, portion of, of our God's word, and it's still so profoundly simple and beautifully profound in, in those regards, because the, these words, and as, as Peter is helping us understand them, they, they, they find their cohesion in one very clear thing, the, the living stone, 
Right? So the whole focus on that which is essential is the, the living stone. It's, it's a, the, the stone that is hewn out for a purpose and a very specific task that is going to accomplish that purpose and, and that task. It's living in the sense that it is life and it has life and, and it gives life. And of course, of course, by God's grace, we would see these words and say, the one stone esteemed essential is Jesus. And he's not just plan A, he's, he's plan only. And you see how, how Peter begins to un unpack these words for, for us. He is the cornerstone, the capstone, the keystone. In him and in him alone, he was set apart for the purpose of forgiving us and giving us life, the opportunity to enjoy all of God's blessings for winning and opening us heaven and then daring to call it home. This is, this is amazing. Of course, of course, of course, he's esteemed essential. But not by everyone. God himself is, is the one that says that there is no other. I am the way and the truth and the life. Our, our John 14 dialogue of Jesus makes that wildly clear for us to stop and, 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 and behold. There is no other option in terms of eternal salvation and security in heaven and forgiveness. There is none. Even though, though God declares it, it's a wild thing how, how sinners dismiss that. But pay, pay attention. Sinful dismissal does not negate what God declares. Let, let me say that again. Sinful dismissal does not negate what God declares. So God says Jesus is the esteemed essential, and, and no matter what the world says, Jesus is the esteemed essential. No matter how our world, no matter how we, See him as non-critical to our days, non-essential to our lives. Let's unpack that just for a minute. Maybe we can think about it this way. Ask a worker who was laid off what it's like to be considered non-essential to the workforce and see the hurt in their eyes. Ask, ask a mom what it's like to be considered non-critical to a family and feel the hurt in her heart. Whether either of those are you or, or not, just pretend just for a moment what it's like to know that somehow in some way you're special and you're valued and you're different and then have the entire world set you aside seeing that you're not. Ponder then the, the reality that God in his grace from eternity to eternity says, my son, my Jesus, this Christ, the Messiah, is essential for salvation. And before you see the hurt in Jesus' eyes, see the sin in your heart. Why in all the world do you continue to deem him non-essential in the way that you live? Why, why do you why do you write his words off as non-critical in the steps that you take in your daily life? Why do you view someone else's sacrifice as so much more awe-inspiring even just a few short weeks after Easter? You can ask yourself, you know you better than anybody else. What is it in your life, in your day, in your problems, in your struggles that, that kind of chalks Jesus up as some non-fundamental, non-essential, non-critical, easily dismissible person. And the moment you start to see the sin in your heart, the sin that needs forgiveness and pardon, the wrongs and the offenses, the arrogance and the ignorance that needs the news of peace. Recognize that Jesus' eyes smile to share it with you. 
Remember, we, we talked already that, that, that for something to be essential, it's not just a person or a thing, but it's a person or a thing that's designated for a specific task, right? So, so the capstone was the, the stone that tied all the whole building together. The cornerstone was the stone from which every angle in the building was built and from which it derived its angle. The, the, the keystone is that which made it beautiful. So what is Jesus? The capstone rejected. The keystone oh, set aside the cornerstone over which people stumble. But what's his purpose? What is it that, that God esteemed essential? It's, it's forgiveness. And it's pardon. And it's, it's peace. It's the removal of guilt and the hope and the assurance and the confidence of heaven when we close our eyes in death. That kind of brings us into the next aspect. Like, re realize this, that the one esteemed essential is Jesus. And from God's eyes, we see that. And by his grace, profound and beautiful and beautiful and profound, from, from our eyes, we get to see that too. But the one esteemed essential from his eyes is you. Because he came to lay his life aside for you. No matter who you are or where you are or what you've done, he came to, to take up your every sin and offense, to die your death so that you might live and have life in him. Remember, he was the one rejected and forsaken so that we might be forgiven. The living stone placed in, in front of a cave so that we might have life. And so that death that doesn't hold him can't hold us either. And in him and by him and because of him, he dares to see you as essential to him. We could put it this way. Inside of this essential relationship, he is the redeemer and you're the redeemed. And he is the forgiver and you're the forgiven. And he's the savior and you're the saved. And he's the living stone. And in love, he dares to call you a living stone in him too. Which means you're essential to him. And you're essential for him as well. You see, you're not just some stone that's misshapen that he tosses out on the back berm to get grown with weeds and never to look at again. If he calls you essential, he uses you for a purpose. No matter how less than luxurious our life is. No matter how small we feel or insignificant the world may see us, God in his grace considers you essential, and it's marvelous. Peter brings that out for us, too. Pay, pay attention. I'm in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, and I'm going to jump down to, to verses 9 and 10. So let's, let's find out the task for which Christ esteems us essential. Here's those words again. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Go with me to verse 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Friends, marvel, marvel, marvel. The esteemed essential is marvelous, and it's you. You get to know that. You get to wake up every day knowing that you're important to God, important enough for him to die, that you're loved by God, loved enough for him to die, and that he actually uses you with purpose as a living stone to accomplish his task. Did you see the task that he's, that he's given us inside of these words from, from 1 Peter chapter 2? I hope so. Look, look with me at, at verse 9. Look what he dares to call these essential, these essential ones to, to you and to me. You are a chosen people. First of all, I, I understand how, how marvelous this is. There's, there, there's a... a there's a relationship here. Literally, you're, you're a family chosen. 
That means God still associates with you and draws you close. That means that the eternal I am, Emmanuel, our brother, our Jesus, loves to be associated with you and refuses to be eternally and socially distanced from you. You're a family member of his. He loves spending time with you, chosen people. A royal priesthood. This is purpose. Oh my goodness, this, this is purpose. We've been esteemed essential with a, a royal opportunity and, and a special service to to go about the task that he's given us, and then to go about those tasks, not as though we're trying to, to win his favor or earn his favor, but because by grace we have his favor, and because he already smiles on the work that's done. A chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a mass wonderfully set apart. There's privilege here. That God gives us an opportunity to do something no other people, no other nation gets to do. Serve him and share him. And then, a people belonging to God. Please understand what God says in this connected to purpose and connected to privilege, connected to prestige. You're special to them. You. The world may write you off as insignificant. God doesn't. Workforces may see you as non-essential. God refuses. Instead, he considers you his prized possession, essential to him, and there is nothing that can rob him of you, and there is nothing that can rob you of him. You're his. You, dear friend, are that important to him. And then as he wraps all of these things into this beautiful relationship and this gospel reality. He reminds you and me that, that we have another special purpose. He's called us to be living stones. He's esteemed us essential. Why? Verse 9, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of, out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Marvel with me at, at, at this. In this time in which we live, our whole world is jolted to a stop, but the gospel message does not stop. To some degree, we can step back from this global circumstance and pandemic and situation and say everything has changed, but the gospel has not changed, and you know it, and you get to go and proclaim it. Because God esteems you essential, and it's marvelous. How about Mom's Day? Moms, we love you, and, and we thank God for you. From our perspective, here's what we're going to do. We're, we're going to give you individually a card to let you know that you're loved, and you are. What if God uses us, each of us, young in age and young in heart, to go tell our moms and dads how much Jesus loves them, to go tell our family and our neighbors that God set the entire world aside because you mattered to him. What, what if what's essential is Jesus and what he sees essential is you and the essential task that he's given us to do is to go and proclaim his mercy so that more and more and more people might live in the joy knowing Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia and amen. Friends, the peace of God that transcends all understanding guards your hearts, your lives in Christ Jesus. Amen.
Yeah, and please, please feel free to take just a few minutes and, and reflect on that. Delight in that truth. And God bless you in it every single day until we see him in glory. A marvelous reality, friends, that the good shepherd doesn't say, follow me, I'll be way over there, <laughs> right? He says, follow me, I'm still right here. I'm with you always, and with God with us, we, we get to stop and talk to him, and he loves it. He loves it. He always has time to hear us, to listen, to help, and to put his heart, to bend his heart, stoop his heart to ours, and listen to our prayers. So we get to approach him today. In the, in the prayer that, that he taught us, we also have as well a, a prayer of thanksgiving for the, for the moms that, that we have, what beautiful examples they are, what stunning people they are. God bless it. It's a, they're gifts. As well as um, some, some dear ladies connected to our congregations that, that are going through some health hurdles, uh, our friend Celia, our friend Connie, and our friend Irene, all, all of whom are, are battling random health issues. Let's pray. Gracious Savior, you have taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Gracious Savior, in, in profound grace and gracious profoundness, you deemed us essential enough to set glory aside and die. You deemed us essential to forgive, and we get to know that. Even as we delight that you are the one essential for salvation, we delight, Lord, that, that you have brought us to your side. Thank you for keeping us in that truth. Thank you for calming our anxious souls in that truth. Continue to bless us with grace and faith to simply follow you wherever you might lead, knowing that through whatever valleys it ends here, it ends in heaven where we are with you. Keep us firm and focused until that day, and then embolden us until then to go and proclaim to the world what you have done for the world. Bless us in our mission, dear Savior. Lord, thank you for our moms. What a beautiful vocation it is that, that you have, have given to these women. Absolutely gorgeous. Thank you for the grace on their heart by which they have gone and still go about the work that you have given them. Teach us a humble appreciation, a glad thanksgiving for all of our moms. Bless them with a, with a happy Mother's Day, knowing that we love them every single day, just like you do. Lord, we, we pray as well for individuals close to our church family that have some health hurdles. For Celia, for Connie, and for Irene, all of them who, who battle various different things, we ask that you would grant them strength sufficient for every hurdle, that you would bless them and heal them physically as it is your will, but above all, that you would grant them spiritual health to know your goodness and sing your praise as they have always done. Fix their faith on you. Hear us as we pray in your name. Hear us, Lord, as well, as we bring you our own hearts' private prayers. Lord Jesus, you show us the way to the Father through your life and death. You show us the truth of salvation through your words and promises. You show us the life by your resurrection. With joyful hearts and glad voices and happy lives, we say to you, Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Right, and then the, the God who comforts us and is with us is also bold to assure us with his promise. May the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. A friend, from our perspective, Jesus is the only one essential. And from his perspective, you're essential too. Thank you for celebrating the reality of the gospel, the beauty of his grace with us. God bless you as your soul finds comfort in him alone. And God strengthen you and all of us to go and tell our neighbors and loved ones, our moms, our dads, our sisters, brothers, everyone, just how much God so loved the world. Because what we know and what we have, they, they need to know and they need to have it too. Remember, the Savior who died to open heaven for you died to open heaven for them. Go, go and tell them. Again, thank you for joining us wherever and whenever you might be in this interesting time and interesting situation. Um, if you need anything, please, please, please give us a call or contact us however, however you want to. Jesus always had time for people. So do our ministries. We always have time for you. Happy to get together anytime. If you'd like to study with us, we would love that opportunity. Um, Wednesdays uh, at 9.30 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. There's the At Home with the Psalms led by, by Vicar Ehlert. The information is on your service booklet. Thursday mornings at 9.30 and Thursday evenings at 6.30 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. There's our look at the, the book of Ecclesiastes, pondering life under the sun and life beyond the sun. Beautiful perspective. And as always, um, if, if you'd like to get together individually to be reminded of God's love, hugged in God's word and strengthened by God's supper, please give us a call too. Again, you're, you're important to the Savior. You're important to us. God bless you. We'll look forward to seeing you again real soon. Thank you. This joyful Easter tide away with sin and sorrow. My love, the crucified, has sprung to life this morrow. Had Christ who once was slain not burst his three-day prison, our faith had been in vain. But now is Christ the risen, the risen, the risen. But now is Christ the risen. Death's blood has lost its chill since Jesus crossed the For a season slumber Till Trump from east to west Shall wake the dead in number Had Christ who once was slain That first is three